Thanks all for being here. This is our monthly webinar uh, talking today about managing change in design systems, right? Design systems and the, the journeys we're all on and the things we're trying to support within our product orgs is, is really about change management more than anything, you know, more, though, more so than about tools or, or assets. So excited to dig into that today with someone who, who knows a lot about it. It's helped a lot of teams through that process. Um, uh, just before we get into the meat of that, you know, shameless plugs here, uh, we got another one of these coming up, not surprisingly. Uh, next month, we're going to be digging into systems of systems and theming and all the things we see really necessary to support you know, these organizations going through change, organizations like yours working at scale, maybe you have multiple brands, business units. There's so many things to support to try and create the efficiencies and, and capture the goals of systems, uh, but actually do it in a practical way that works with a complex product org. Right? So we're gonna be, uh, our, our CTO, our, our co-founder, Evan, uh, will be speaking with Brad Frost, whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, so be sure to register for that and check it out. You can see it on our events page on the site. Um, as far as the uh, upcoming events, we have uh, a number of those as well. We're going to be in New York here twice within the next couple of months. Uh, and then is on the West Coast uh, in April, uh, pulling together uh, customers, partners, peers, folks within the industry to talk about the challenges of, you know, digital production at scale, uh, change management and design systems. Uh, the goal to get leaders connected around uh, you know, sharing insights and building community so you can have connections even you know outside of just what what knapsack is facilitating uh, with that um, excited to get into today's event so i'm andrew i lead the customer facing teams here at knapsack uh, and i'm joined here by nathan curtis uh, nathan you want to say hello to everyone hello everybody and hi andrew how are you doing i'm doing well how are you i'm doing great thanks so uh, Nathan's obviously been through a lot of uh, change management when it comes to design systems, working with teams, uh, and uh, we're excited to get some of his experience as we dig into a number of topics. But I'm getting one comment that we're not seeing slides changing. Are you all seeing my slides change at the moment? No, you're not. So. Um, awesome. Let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, change the way we're sharing. Sorry about that. Um, there they zoom. are. Uh, all right. So we should see... Uh, how about now, right? We've, uh, we're seeing, we're seeing things change, right? So, um, upcoming webinars, check these things out. Uh, please register for our events. All this is go to the link at the bottom, go to our events page. All right. But, um, the, the, the person of the hour that's here to discuss with us and hopefully share some of the awesome insights is, is Nathan. So, uh, founder and partner at eight shapes, uh, Nathan works with a number of different teams to you know, guide them and, and, and give them insights as, as they go through change management, right. And try to find success with their design systems. Uh, and, I, you know, that's that's what we try and do at Knapsack as well. Ultimately, we have a platform, we have infrastructure, but all of that is about supporting a way of working. And, you know, something that we'll touch on here that, that we experience every day with our customers is that, you know, it's not just about getting, you know, the, the state that we want to be in, the future vision for our design system or our digital product org. It's about the journey to get there, right? We got to start with wherever you are today. Uh, and so that's that's how we think about, you know, onboarding and implementation on our platform. And that's really how, you know, we all need to approach design systems if we're going to, you know, actually get to some of those goals. Uh, so, you know, today is going to be really about uh, sort of a discussion, right? Similar to, to maybe a podcast interview, where right? We're going to share our experience and, you know, try and touch on a handful of things in a, a somewhat cohesive narrative here around, you know, what are the the insights that we would like to share and the things that we see teams doing that are, are reaching the successes that I think we'd all aspire to. Um, so uh, sort of the rough outline of what we're going to go through today in terms of topics, uh, how do you actually get started with change, right? we got to start somewhere. Um, how should we think about sort of the, how change progresses, right? And there's a certain incremental nature to it that we all want to embrace. Um, you know, how do we think about enablement, right? This is a very human thing to change management, right? So how do we bring people along within the, the structure of organizations uh, and, and use the right strategies to create engagement, get adoption? Um, how do we continue to create alignment and communicate, right? We all, I think everyone's been through this, is seen it's not a, a launch it and, you know, you're done, it's good. Uh, so how do we continue to create that engagement and you know what is what is done is there done right so we're going to talk through a lot of these things again please drop your questions in uh, drop your comments in as we go uh, we want to be able to react to this and, and keep it engaging and again we'll leave at least 20 minutes at the end to to go through uh, any questions that come up awesome. so with that let me stop sharing that i may not be working and you know just uh i start very simply i mean Nathan, we've got teams of all scales here that are, you know, starting in all different places, uh, but all looking at some degree of, of change management with design systems. Uh, where do you start? That's a big question. And I think <laughs> as we were preparing for this uh, conversation, one that was a real challenge because starting what from where 
to serve who. There's so many variables to this that make people listening to this conversation feel challenged. Some people might be a design system team of one that's starting a design system for the first time in 2024 at a new company that they just started working at. And another person might be part of a multi-platform design system that's existed for five years and is just about to start its fourth generation of work to completely refactor and rebuild a lot of it from the ground up. So thinking about what change is, you have to think about really what is going to change, how big is it going to be, and how different is it going to be from, from other teams. I ground on stories that, that I've lived in the past as a, a lead on design system programs. That's what I do as a consultant. I come in and at times I'll, I'll lead the program or partner with the leads of the program. And uh, one of them was at Morningstar. And we actually started a design system in 2017. Uh, we had six months to do it and we built the design system from the ground up. But actually we were lucky because the visual language was already pretty well established. We just needed to refine it to make sure the button color was accessible and to refine it to make things that were consistent across the catalog. And so the actual change of building it for the first time wasn't as big or challenging for us and for other people accepting it for the first time wasn't as big because the degree of change wasn't strong from what they previously had, but the efficiency gains and the ability to change in the future were considerable. So it was relevant, it was worthwhile, and, and it was an easy sell to go in. And so you have to think about what are you changing from, not just like the lack of a system to a system, but really the, the lack of a, of a design language, the lack of a technical framework, the lack of something, and what do you need to change them to? And are they gonna be willing acceptors of that change? Yeah, I love not just the idea of, you know, the the, the recognition of where you are in the North Star, but also that uh, the degree, concept of a degree of change and being very cognizant of that. We're going to come back to that, I think, a little bit as we talk about that sort of incremental nature. Thank you. When I think about, you know, where to get started, it often comes down to you know, priority alignment, right? We've seen teams that are waving a design system at, at product leadership and saying, hey, this needs to be a priority. Uh, and then we see teams who find ways to align to existing priorities, right? Well, how do you how do you think about or how do you guide teams when it comes to like, Hey, how do I make this a priority for my organization? Right. Because I believe in it. How do I make it happen? Well, I think I always favor Alex from uh, the Atlas Indian design system. She was the lead of their design system for years. And she spoke at the Clarity Conference about um, hitching your wagon. And oftentimes there are groups that are or organizations that are going through some sort of broader change, a redesign, a technical refactor to shift from Angular to React you know, something that is galvanizing considerable change across a wide swath of potential adopters to which the design system becomes an enabler. And in that sense, there's an external force driving the change to which you're really hitching to that endeavor and providing the design system as a way to achieve that goal in a better way that creates long-term business value for the customers. Those are frankly the easier ways to, to sell the design system. Um, even though you still have a lot of selling work, could they deliver that change without having a design system? Yeah, they could. So you need to talk about the pros and cons and, and be able to sell the design system in that context. It's a lot harder to sell it from an internal perspective. Hey, I think a design system is a great idea. I think we need to be more consistent and the design system is the way. If other groups that would adopt your system aren't otherwise going through a considerable change, then that's, that's a tougher sell because the benefit for them probably doesn't exceed the cost. And so you have to think about benefits and costs or impacts versus effort, or a colleague of mine named Talia Fisher from Verizon is always saying, is the juice worth the squeeze? And you have to get convinced them that if they're gonna squeeze something that the juice that they get out of it is gonna be worth the effort they put into squeezing it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I see that with a lot of teams, kind of the prioritization thing coming down on on two scales. There's the side of you, know, you spoke to this of you you can get investment in purely the design system as a practice as a as a sort of um, you know effort, but it's easier to do that if you say, hey, the CTO has this initiative that's really ambitious. This is all in service of that, right? We're not coming to you saying I need a budget to make a design system practice. You're saying hey, I want to help you accelerate and de-risk this big initiative you want to do. And if we get more systematic in how we work, it's going to enable that, right? You can have the exact same conversation and to some degree, whether we label it its own priority of design system versus, you know, a, laddering it up to another existing priority, that that helps get investment just kind of in, in the initiative in general. We also see teams that are, you know, when it comes to a more kind of focused point of how do I get 
say, a team to start using the design system? Or how do I get the design system from a concept or a Figma library into product? You can say, well, you can build components and then go tell product managers they need to prioritize putting the design system in, retrofitting. Or you can go to product managers first and say, what is your roadmap? What are the priorities? What are the initiatives that you're worried about resources on? Okay, we're going to lean in and help you deliver those. And you know what? The things that you're going to use and need that we know should be part of the system, those are going to be the first things we build, not necessarily you know, the button of the card or whatever else we would have prioritized, but say, I'm going to align my effort to accelerating existing product priorities. And same kind of idea, just you know, whether you're talking on the macro CTO level or the Hey, how do I get a product manager to be excited and not resistant to, you know, working with the system team? I see it. I see it play out on kind of a variety of scales. I think yeah, Dan Wall talks about that a bit when he talks about your next component and how can you just dive into a context and provide immediate value because that's something they need. Uh, I think that the, there's really two. That, that's along a spectrum of the way to look at it, and I do think that aligning with and understanding and talking with the product owners that are creating priorities is really important. You can't just talk to designers or just talk to developers because typically they aren't the deciders on what teams work on next. And so being connected to people who influence and ultimately decide what the work is gonna be for each of those adopters is important. And I think delivering components that have relevance and, and features that have value that can directly impact their work is a good idea, but you have to balance that because design systems typically are delivering the smaller fundamental bits and the smaller things that teams are using to compose bigger experiences. And so if you dive in and you talk to a homepage team, and we should come back to the homepages, if you talk to the homepage team, they're going to be like, we need a huge carousel at the top of the page. I'm going to be like, I have no interest in building that in a design right. system ever in my life. So I'd immediately <laughs> would walk away from that conversation. That next component isn't the right component to start a journey to create a system uh, necessarily, because you need all sorts of visual language. You probably need to set the tone inside the carousel with all sorts of smaller things that those smaller things are going to be really relevant to everybody, but the carousel only relevant to that one page. And so you have to balance those things to make sure that the, the choices you make to invest in those small incremental bits are going to lead you to the target state somewhere in the future of the catalog that everybody is welcomingly using. Yeah, I um, I think that's a good kind of segue to the the second point I want to get into just around this incremental nature of change, and we I think we really see it as a necessity, right? We all we've all seen teams that have spent months after doing their inventory working. You know, I talk about working in a cave, you know, building out and defining the perfect system, only to hand it down and say, now it's time to use this. Please prioritize this. Not a chance is that going to be successful, right? Versus the teams that engage their the, the users of the system early and often and have that kind of dialogue and are working with them to support and align priorities. Um, but I think there's also, um, you know, the idea of, you know, how do you, how, how do you go about planning that? Cause it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to say, I, I, I can't just define the spec and here's what we believe the system needs to be versus, Hey, I'm, I'm in some way letting it be dictated or influenced by product teams. So, so what, what kind of framework would you provide? Or is there any way that you can kind of give teams some tools to say, Hey, here's how you think about, what those increments should be as you get started and, and build build a process and momentum. Well, it's a it's a model that has a number of different dimensions, so it's it's hard to really dig into the whole thing. But I back up from the target state, which is the future. I want to see is a system spread across an ecosystem of products that has a range of features that they're all benefiting from, and they're starting to share and make things across each other, without necessarily us building everything. But in order to do that, you need a minimally viable system. And I like to talk about design systems as products because it triggers or puts in place a lot of other mental models. Oh, we release things that other people use and we need to support them. We need to market them. We need to prioritize the features we need to make over time in a central kit that other people are going to start to build from. And part of that is thinking about what's the minimum catalog or set of sort of components and fundamentals and so on that they're going to use. Uh, that they're going to be willing to start using your kit. And for a lot of teams, they're going to want a reasonably sized catalog uh, to start from, uh, or else they can find some other dependency that is a similar thing that has all those things that they can start from. And so what's the generation of that first catalog need to be? And I talk about a generation, which means a version of a technical and or design toolkit framework like Figma and React, for which you build, a generation of, of kits, of, of parts that are going to remain stable and grow and enhance over a period of time. 
And so backing from that, there might be a subset of all those adopters willing to deal with a beta that is a partial kit that is built at a relevant, relatively good amount of quality uh, that they're willing to use in production. And then you back up from that, how are we going to start just revealing to those potential beta adopters via some alpha that we're going to just show how the things are made and we're going to have enough things made that they can start to see how they're going to implement them. And then before that, how are we just going to prove the concept of what an icon looks like or where a package is going to go and so on. And so like the systems themselves, I'm breaking down what is a large target state into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller incremental bits such that there is a clear path for us to get from the, to the first bit, the demo or the experience and then the alpha and so on. And so I think that about that generationally and, and breaking down all the features and road mapping, how we're going to do it and thinking in all the dependencies. But generally, it's how do you break down all those things you want to achieve into a small enough set that you can start to experiment with your best friends or your sort of pilot adopters, whatever you want to call them, uh, to begin the snowball effect of this starting to roll into other groups, too. So I, to that point, how do you think about, you know, figuring out who those right folks are beyond the immediate confidants and folks, you know, will be part of the, you know, very innermost circle because you actually start to think about adoption. I know we all have thoughts on adoption that we'll get to in a little bit, but you know, how do how, how do I plan that audience and that those segments as I start to iterate? Well, there, there's two things that come to mind. One is one of the near fails of a design system that I ever worked on was I went into a big bank with my team and we were all coordinating. We had a great primary point of contact, but that person literally refused. I gave them a spreadsheet. It just had a column that said adopters. And I said, just, just type in what teams are going to use this. I don't know who the teams are. It's like, put just <laughs> list out what designers you think might start using the design portion of the toolkit. I'm not really sure. And I was like, you don't know who you're selling to. Like, I was like, how, how can we succeed without knowing who they are? And if you can't get them to fill out a basic spreadsheet of cells, you got a problem or you need to start doing that yourself by walking around and talking to people or figuring out the communities and so on. The other thing is once you start to map out who they are, and we can, if you want to talk about that more in depth, you start to identify dimensions of the organization, business units, smaller teams, are they organizing by journeys and so on. And then I might refer to other things here, but there's this great book called Change by Damon Santola. I just finished reading it and I'm so equipped with all these different concepts of how to think about shepherding big change. Uh, but one of the things Damon writes about is uh, how you really start to address that big ecosystem of, adopt of adopters. Imagine you've written down every adopting team in a spreadsheet. One approach could be a shotgun approach. We're just going to spray communication across all 50 and just hope for the best. Turns out that's not the best way to convey change. Another way is silver bullet. We're going to get some superstar in the organization to be the super, the silver bullet voice of what we're going to project out as value. And everybody else is just going to follow that silver bullet or that key influence. That also doesn't work. But there's a third way that uh, he talks about, which is snowball effect. And that's particularly what I gravitated to, which was how do you figure, how do you determine not necessarily the most important adopters, but the adopters that are most willing to change, that are most eager for a solution, that are most interested in working with you? And how do you find those to actually target all your communications, target all your white glove concierge support, mm -hmm. target how you're going to interact with them during the alpha and beta portions I talked about to start to have them using your stuff, you're learning and refining along the way. And you're maybe not even communicating that much to everybody else. Instead, you're, you're really finding the pockets for which once you reach a certain tipping point, it just snowballs into the whole org. And so that, that's how I would think about the different uh, opportunities you have across your ecosystem of adopters and beware of just sending out emails and hoping for the best with some sort of shotgun approach yeah. to spray value across everything. Yeah, there's so many great concepts tied up in this. And I, you know, I think about a lot of teams, we've probably all been there or know these teams that are still in skunk work mode, right? It's a bunch of folks who know this is worthwhile, but you know, if you're thinking about how do I get the, the chief product officer to green light a bunch of budget, you know, it's probably easier to focus your resources on how do I go to some finance team that has a web UI that has no support and would just love to have help and build a thing and make it better, right? So how do you find ways to focus on, you know, where can I get a win? Where can I build a success story? Where can I lean in a little bit? 
and you know some of this is is uh, Simon Sinek has talks about you know the crossing the chasm as it relates to human enablement, where if you try and go broad and say, hey everyone, we can make you all better at this, you're going to get crickets or a handful of hand raisers versus if you go somewhat narrow and focused and lean in and make them wildly successful, whether they're a sales team or a product org or whatever, suddenly you get you know a lot of FOMO, right? Everyone else being like, well, you create demand, right? Everyone says, I I want that, right? So get some wins. To your point earlier, don't go to the homepage. Right. We, that's a big, there's a spotlight on that, right? You're probably, you're probably going to fail and failing is great. You learn stuff, but like, don't do that as your first project, you know, go to something that again is, is really would love the help and that you can demonstrate a win and, and create some learnings. Uh, and then I think, you know, yeah, from there. Like, yeah. And like talking about change too, related to all the different adopters in that ecosystem, it's a lot about framing and success. Isn't necessarily what they expect it to be, but it's how you frame it. And you need to draw good boundaries around what is successful adoption in the first six months or the first six months of a rollout of a new generation. Is it 100% adoption or is success actually these different snowball like focus points all have adopted it and that's our objective and that's what, what we want to we want to succeed with. I also like to draw boundaries around the relevance of the system in general. Uh, particularly in really large orgs like insurance companies, banks, big software companies, et cetera, our design system isn't meant to serve all of them. The, the classic example that almost every company has is a product-oriented design system isn't meant for the marketing site and vice versa. They are legitimately separate enterprises that change at different rates, have different customers and influences, and have different intents around their design language, componentry, and frameworks that they're built on. So why converge them? They don't have to be the same thing. And so framing things as our design system is for consumer products, and thus it's not for business products. And suddenly you get rid of the risk of what Damon and this author talks about as countervailing influences. Because if you draw boundaries and you frame the role of your system appropriately, that we're not for business products, suddenly business products who are uh, conscientious objectors, if they were tweeting, they would say never adopt as a hashtag, you know, all those people that are creating all this negative energy, when you're not actually trying to serve them in general, how can you frame things, maybe to not be as ambitious as everybody expects, you say, I want to start a design system, a lot of people trigger, okay, that's for the whole company. No, sorry, that's not for the whole company. Uh, or wow, I, I have my design system and there's another business one and there's another internal product one. And everyone's like, oh my God, the thing we need to do is consolidate all of those. Nope, not the right change. That's the wrong framing of what the role of a particular system is to create value in a business. You know, I, I, you remind me, we've had a lot of uh, conversations recently that um, highlight the weird connections between the concept of design systems and Conway's law. Are you familiar with Conway's law? Uh, I've heard it. I should know it. Remind me what it in, is. In software development, the, it's the idea that the end product you produce is um, often reflects the organizational structure. So if you mm -hmm. think about a company like IBM creating IBM cloud products, it's actually, the, the Carbon team will, has written about this, it's actually a fairly segregated UX, user experience across these different products that are built by different product business units, right? And, and we often talk about that in terms of the plight of a lot of design system teams is, they, they, they think they're working on one thing, but in reality, just what design's looking at and documentation and testing and code playgrounds, it's all so diff separated that it actually is not as aligned as anyone thinks, right? But there's also this other idea, which is that we need to very intentionally structure how we work, the infrastructure for things like systems and building product to appropriately reflect the structure of our organization. Whether that's, you know what, this is a, there is no connection. Maybe there's some foundational level of tokens at a brand level, but like, there really is no connection between marketing and, and product. We get into a lot of conversations around kind of the nested hierarchy and systems of systems of these big orgs of, you know, how do you let teams have brand discretion and even their own design system, but not let have all of them rebuild the same basic patterns at even just a core code level. So, you know, the idea of really thinking about the interplay between the organization structure of, you know, the structure of your organization and how you work and how you set up your tools and workflows. Uh, it's worth every team spending a little time thinking about it, whether it's the danger side or the opportunity side. Yeah, it's really going to be up to you as a person, even as a solo designer, to be at least cognizant enough of and be able to articulate the role of your system relative to other things. And don't be afraid of saying no or drawing boundaries that people didn't expect but end up being narrower 
than than what they had anticipated they would be. That is okay. And that gives you a better opportunity to have smaller but more likely wins that start to build into something bigger rather than casting your net too wide. Yeah, I've seen an interesting trend in the last year or two of a lot of teams that have decided to pair back in terms of what's in their system. And, you know, they had 100 components suddenly and, you know, 30 or 40 felt more appropriate because, you know, it's a little bit of what are we deciding we need to provide guidance on, you know, a little bit of the enablement and engagement side of how do we create things that are useful and not, you know, too restricting or, or too loose. So uh, it's been interesting to see that kind of calibration for, for mature teams. For sure. So how do you think about, you know, all everything we're saying, change management, it's, it, 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 you know, it never stops, right? There's a lot of ongoing, uh, you know, intentional decision-making, some stuff that may not feel intuitive to your audience. You know, how do you, we talked about alignment and communication and the imperative of keeping all, you know, keeping this conversation going. Um, how do you think about creating that engagement on an ongoing basis and making sure you're not getting stale or you're not being too myopic with kind of design system plans? Yeah. Rephrase that. I'm not sure. So exactly what you're asking. Every, everything that we're talking about is, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, decision making and a lot of, you know, ongoing change. And, you know, ultimately, you know, adoption is not the key metric, but we're also thinking about how do we continue to, to impact more and more of our product org. All of that takes a lot of communication on an ongoing basis. Right. Mm -hmm. I've seen teams that have been too subject to one way communication. They've said, where does our cadence? We do this stuff. We release it. Um, and I think we've all said that level, you know, more two-way engagement is powerful. So uh, what are the kind of principles or guidelines you give to teams around how do you communicate with and engage with your audience beyond just releases and a docs updates, you know, to, to keep the success going? Yeah, that's, it gets a, um, into how you perceive your connectedness to all of the other endeavors and particularly to those that integrate and use what you offer to them. Um, I've always been an advocate that design systems serving a wide and diverse or uh, array of adopters need to be a separate concern from any of those single adopters. So if you're integrated into a flagship product uh, and you change as they change, then you're really locked away from being able to change in a consistent manner to serve everyone else too. But being a separate concern from any individual product and releasing and then upgrading to the releases that you have doesn't mean that you're independent of them. You need to foster practices that are interdependent. And so part of that is about being mutually aware of your roadmaps and exposing what your roadmaps are, not just, hey, we just changed as X to Y, uh, but also we are about to change from A to B, and we're hoping pretty soon after that to change from C to D or offer E, F, and G. And so their visibility and, and your ability to clearly communicate, not just what's happening right now, but where you're going in a way that's visible to them is really important. Why don't the more design systems have roadmaps on their documentation site or where, however they're communicating? I don't know, we should. Um, another thing is thinking about the different kinds of bridges you have into the community too. Um, Different design systems have different ways to connect into that ecosystem. One of the ways is just by having really good relationships with adopters that are really energized and, and really come to the system, ask all the questions constantly in the support channels. And those end up being visible conversations in support channels like Slack or Teams that other teams can see. And, and hopefully you can start more and more conversations in that kind of open community. Design systems also have, let's call them advocates that uh, are spread, but are, are very clear, very strong bridges to individual people uh, out there in the community that can speak for the system, advocate for it. And oftentimes these days tend to be correlated with those that have their own sort of extended or expanded libraries that build upon the system that multiple teams are, are depending on. And so that advocacy and that sort of spread of additional libraries, sharing components around your ecosystem tends to be a way to not just communicate change and understand what change needs to happen, but actually propagate change from a central place out into uh, more and more localized bits. Uh, the last thing is um, how wide are your bridges to each of the different groups and how do you orient towards ultimately in a mature system, making sure that you've got a strong connection to the products that matter most that are gonna essentially push the design system to change. If you're supporting a sort of website app experience where there's there's an e-commerce site and beyond once you purchase the product there's a lot of management and accounts stuff like that 
well, there's probably a team at the upper end of the funnel, probably a team at the lower end of the funnel, probably a team working the main app uh, for iOS and Android. There, there are a range of wide, well, let's call them wide bridges that the design system team needs to have into those different key teams so that the system is evolving as the major parts of the experience or journeys are also evolving. And so that's really effortful. You need to be constantly uh, reminding yourself what do those different people think? What do those different sort of other ends of those bridges think and need? And maintaining those lines of communication often fall on people like me and the people I partner with that are leads of the design system program. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, in the context of sort of the, the tooling and platform side, we have a lot of conversations that sometimes are about, you know, how do I share a roadmap or release notes or how do I, you know, have comment threads. But to your point, that we see them all so interconnected between, you know. Sometimes it initiates because there's a tech, you know, version change and you need to initiate something new. But, you know, all the feedback, all the questions, all the comments, bug reports, you know, ideally that's feeding right back into your queue for how you're prioritizing work. Right. And in an ideal state, it's contributions. Right. It's not just a ticket. Right. People are saying, hey, I made this React component better and I got a, a PR for you or I made this Figma you know, UI that I didn't find one of, but is a, a common pattern we need. And when we can really get teams to kind of embrace that way of working and that collaboration between the experienced professionals building and designing your products and the experienced professionals building and design and maintaining the system, right? It becomes such a healthier and more sustainable way for the product orgs to work because we've we've prioritized as an organization the idea that we should always be iterating on the great things we've designed and built. And that's not about a central services team, right? That's about a way that a whole organization operates. Uh, and it requires a lot of ongoing communication and to your point, wide bridges. Yeah, I think to it, it speaks to as your design system matures, the role of the design system and actually the activities of the people that are making the design system will evolve and change. And sometimes people don't want to evolve into those different kinds of roles. If a design system is first a product, a thing that you make in one place, you release it and other people consume uh, via code packages or Figma library assets or what have you, Eventually, the, you're going to need to also have services, support, consulting, pairing with different teams, and so on. But we're now clearly in a space, I think we're evolving past just a product and a service, but um, being a platform. Like, is the design system team really there, like, you know, to be a tool on top of which everybody else is making stuff and is automating the connections, is automating the reviews, is automating the publishing, is automating the communications so that everybody else can benefit from all the shared components and features and fixes that you were describing. Running a platform and being a support service isn't necessarily at the top of every designer's personal growth path. Right. Um, and so like once you start to drift from making a bunch of token tables and variable collections in Figma, which is awesome, and color swatches, to handling a bunch of support instances and dealing with consulting engagements with stakeholders that don't really care and don't want to work with me. Those are two different lifestyles. Right. So evolving as individuals, from individuals working on design systems from making products to making a platform, that you, your whole, your leadership needs to be cognizant of that shift and even cognizant, cognizant of their own biases, like mine, who loves working on token taxonomies, of deprioritizing the platform investments in favor of the stuff that feels comfortable or yeah. feels familiar, because that's the way you, how you started and, and what you want to continue doing. Yeah, well, and again, good segue, last few minutes, you know, let's talk a little bit about that idea of done, uh, the fallacy of done, as it were, right? And we, you spoke to something we hear a lot, which is even the most mature systems that are well adopted, that are well built, you know, there, there's constant either reselling to new leadership of the ongoing investment and there's ongoing investment because tech standards change, right? The needs of the business change. And so we, we know it's never done in terms of like, just like your, hopefully your product team isn't ever done. Um, but, you, you know, we, we, we talked about adoption a couple of times too. So what are your thoughts on adoption as a metric? And hey, if everyone adopts it, we've done it, right? We, the system is successful. There's no doubt. If people don't use your stuff, you're not creating a lot of business value. And so like the biggest joy that I get out of working on design systems isn't when we have the big launch of the big new Figma toolkit we made. It's when I see those experiences in production uh, that use the system, that benefited from the system. And I'm like, we just created value for our company because all of our cus real customers are using our stuff. And so until everybody's using your stuff 
or maybe not everybody, a lot of people are using your stuff. You're going to not have that sort of intrinsic reward and energy that is created out of that. And so people ask, how should we measure our design systems? Adoption, some teams call it coverage. Uh, but that's clearly going to be one of your main metrics. Are others using the stuff you make? And so then we said, then everybody or many directors anchor on, okay, so 100%, who are all the adopters and are we at 100%? I'm like, well, you know, not everybody needs your system. So let's carve away those that really the system's not relevant for. Okay, now everybody, those are going to use all our components. Actually, not everybody needs every component you make. And so you start to carve away which adopter is going to need what stuff and are they actually realizing the potential of what they could benefit from? And that's a lot harder to define because now you're talking about a lot of the nuances in the measurement and the, your inability to automate understanding a lot of those things. The other thing that really bugs me, there are a lot of um, measurement tools and there's a lot of uh, people creating manual reports that depict all these adopter, all these teams have adopted our stuff and all these other teams haven't adopted our stuff. Bad, wrong. Like, why do, why do they hate us or why are they, why are they resisting us? When the reality is most of the non-adopters haven't seen the point where the business value exceeds the cost of adopting your system and or there's some other reason they're not changing, that doesn't make them bad. That means there's still an opportunity. So depicting the charts literally as green and red, that's a no-no to me. Like you need to use another color to frame those who haven't adopted your stuff because they're growth potential, not a the the problem child and people that need to be reflected on as negative yeah awesome uh well thank you for all the thoughts and the the discussion i do want to turn we're getting some uh influx of questions now so i want to save plenty of time for the audience here uh uh just before we do that so um again if you have to drop off know the the recording is going to be sent out we're actually going to send out a page that has uh, a bunch of the resources compiled here i think we're going to share some links to a number of blog posts that nathan's written about a lot of these topics uh, and so we'll share that along with the recording. Everyone register to get that uh, later today. Um, but in the meantime, we got a whole host of questions here. Um, looking at some in the chat and some in the q and A. I'm gonna to pull a couple out here. Um, so uh, you know, we touched on this a little bit, but let's start at the top. You know, does it does it make sense to create a sort of universal design system that caters to every all the different teams, the the product team, the marketing team, et cetera? I, I know you, you yeah. I ahead. spoke to that a little bit. I think in general, my experience suggests not usually. It depends on the size of your company. If your company has five people in it, yeah, probably. But if you're of an appreciable scale, the it's um, what you would want to look at is across marketing and product, is there enough alignment and enough collaboration that's happening where they're going to be willing to share uh, and, and create a design language, create a technical framework and tooling and architecture and, and be able to share those things. Is sharing possible? The other thing I would look at is, are you gonna change at the same rate based on the same triggers? For example, I worked with a really well-known, uh, a company that had a really well-known product design system. Uh, one that like everybody else was like pointing at as, oh, that's the way we should do ours. And we actually got hired by their marketing arm. And uh, all the marketing executives that we were working with were saying, we should use the product design system. And then the creative lead was like, we're totally going to reinvent our entire visual language for this new campaign. And there became immediate dissonance that they're changing at a different rate to pursue a different language in a way that the product org, which is used by hundreds of different product teams, could care less about. And so, and that, so look for how you're changing and whether or not the moments and the triggers and the alignment is going to really uh, be the same across those boundaries. Yeah, you know, and I see it. there's another question here that I think it's related to, which is about a little more tactical, but hey, design systems are an enabler. How do you sell the idea of it working on different frameworks? And I, I tie that actually to, you know, we, we, we touched on a little bit earlier, like very few teams, we know, are, are totally starting from scratch, blank slate of product, blank, no marketing properties, no tech decisions. And so if you think about how do we create nearest point of value? You know, ideally, first of all, figure out it, for some teams that the, the engineering team is already building the marketing websites and this other stuff, and it's all in, say, React. In which case, you know what, there might be some already existing pathways that make it more sensible to just have a different theme on a common set of React components and want, you know, a couple of Figma libraries then do them separately, right? On other teams, the idea of unifying them, even if creatively it made sense, like brand-wise, is unrealistic in terms of how the just the business operates, right? So 
take that into consideration, but it, it also comes back to this idea that like for, for team, we see a lot of teams that are moving to a place where the system source of truth, if there is one, is, is kind of the spec, this thing that exists above technologies, above design versus code. And we, we can it even include things like, how do we do testing? How do we, what's our CI workflow in engineering, right? What's the structure with which we manage tokens or the workflows, right? And so often there is something that can be shared, right? And then it's a question of thinking about, you know, uh, uh, kind of the spec of a workflow or a, a design or even a, a UI element versus implementation. Maybe it gets implemented differently, you know, for different brands. Maybe there's only parts of this practice or spec that are shared, but, you know, it, it, we got to figure out what are the motivations and what are the realities of today's state of the business? What might be in an ideal state? And then, you know, figure out where we land somewhere in between, right? Again, if we were starting with a blank slate, we could make all kinds of decisions, but that's rarely the case. So, um, yeah, like, you know, first off, shameless plug, I make a spec plugin in Figma. And so if you want to talk about spec, <laughs> I could talk about that for hours. Uh, but I like how you're framing the role of a design specification of a feature, like a component or tokens or whatever needs to be built, uh, as related to this framework question, because, uh, I'd like framing ideas in examples people can see and in design systems, without a doubt, material is the most often referred to design system offered across a range of frameworks. And there's also Adobe spectrum often referred to my personal favorite. I've always loved watching their progress is carbon. And so carbon is available on react. Uh, react is there, uh, call it the reference build, uh, or at least when I last talked to them, the reference build of, of how the design is instantiated in code, but they also offer angular web components, Svelte, view, you know, all these other essentially parallel frameworks that are, that offer roughly the same API and features, uh, at a high level. Uh, across all those catalogs. And so you have to be careful framing uh, your desire on, on what Carbon does, because they have a lot of um, a lot of people working across a lot of different platforms to deliver that kind of system. Um, more often, it's a question like we dealt with at Morningstar, where there is a mix of Vue, React, and Angular. And so the team made the decision to build in web components. And so as we built in web components, it was gonna be something that all three teams could use. And we acknowledge the drawbacks that any individual developer working on any other team isn't really gonna be familiar with web components enough to want to contribute and build in web components to serve their own product. So you have to think about motivations and familiarity with code to participate in a sort of open system like that. Nevertheless, we deliver web components. And as we were making, turns out, everybody without a North Star edict had kind of normed on Vue. So what did the team do the next year? They built it in Vue instead because it, they realized that their adopter ecosystem had shifted in a way that they couldn't predict or weren't able to predict such that they needed to renorm how they're making things. And so be careful and, and not necessarily know where the puck is metaphorically, but also be able to predict where are they going to pass the puck to so that you can be where the puck needs to be, where the puck is going to go sometime in the future too. Well, and I think this is the great thing about this idea of kind of the, the spec above other things, above, above implementation. And, you know, to your point, we mostly hear this from teams. Like we had a webinar that an engineering lead from Meta joined and Meta also does this and they say, Hey, whether you're Figma or Vue or Web Components or Swift, like you're accountable for implementation. We have a team that manages through user research and blah, blah, blah the, the, the spec. They also have a lot of resources. I don't know if you know that. Um, you know, our shameless plug is that that's really what we're trying to do at NAPSEC as a platform is say, here's a, a set of tools you can use to operate around this common understanding of the aspiration, the spec, as well as see the realistic implementation. You got Angular, Web Components, Vue, React, and Figma, maybe an old XD file. Right. And so being able to kind of put a circle around all that stuff and say, you know, creating open and, and clear communication around where we really are in relation to where we want to be and not having this approach where there's a spec and it's what everyone thinks we have. Right. Because it's probably not right in reality across a, a complex ecosystem. So um, I think there's so much power in, in, in that. And it, it, to your point a second ago, it, it, if you embrace it, it future proofs your system a lot and that it's not, you know, saying we're all anchored in React or we're all anchored in you know, even design as the first thing, right? Because again, Figma will go away because something will do to Figma what Figma did to Sketch, right? And yeah. like it, and it, it exhibits the kind of change behavior that in a controlled system of, of a large scale, the spec actually becomes the pivot point between the design process and I'm going to call it the production process. Yep. 
because to make a new component or enhanced component, or whatever, you go through discovery and research, you go through design iterations to get approvals, then you spec it. And that's like a linear process. You tend to go in order. But once the spec is handed off to who you ask, to a range of different producers to make a React component, to make dev docs, to make design docs, to make a Figma component you publish, suddenly it's a range of people across disciplines and often teams, the iOS version, the Android version, et cetera. And suddenly the spec is really um, splitting as a process into many concurrent sort of delivery processes where you don't necessarily have to have them all release at the same time to create value. Um, even in spec, like that, a practice that I'm working with a team now to start is we have a big spec page per component. You actually draw, use a stroked color for green is addition, orange is update, red is deletion. And when you're working on a spec to uh, evolve a component, you actually use an outside stroke on all those different parts in the branch of Figma. Then when you merge it, uh, you actually remove them and change the change history, but still link to that version of the spec so people can see it like it's a code diff. And so, so I was just doing that because the iOS devs who we don't hand off to immediately needed to know what changed. But it turns out suddenly I had a green, orange, red way of visually communicating that the React team was like, uh, can you just show that in the handoff so that we can zoom right in and know where the changes are to this? Because that's how they think, they think about diffs. And right. so suddenly we've got a visual language in our spec to communicate change. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, it, was, it was fun. Uh, I got a couple of questions from, from Chris that are kind of tied together in the chat here around uh, sort of contribution and in some ways what the system should cover, right? Two, two related questions. So one, uh, when someone comes to the design system team and wants to make a variant of something, how do you have that conversation to balance both consistency and innovation? And then the related question in my mind is when is it okay to introduce something completely novel to a product without adding it to the design system? All the number, oh, I'll react strongly to the second thing you said. <laughs> All the time. All the time. Why does everything need to live in the system? Why does everybody go to Fewer, a design system? Put less system in the system, it, right? <laughs> like, like it's the the knee jerk reaction of someone out there, or, or not really the makers, but like like the designers and the devs. But everybody else is like, oh, that's a component. It belongs in the core system. It's like, why is that the mindset? Like, we don't need a carousel in the system. And so I really think, and uh, actually Damon talks about this in the book Change. You have to protect the innovation because good ideas emerge quickly, but reach a ceiling of values. Value, great ideas need time to percolate, to experiment, to iterate in order for them to realize their maximum value or their maximum level of innovation. And so you as a system person should protect the pockets of innovation and actually encourage them, observe them and see how you can support them to innovate and push the boundaries of what you haven't defined yet. And that, in my opinion, needs to happen locally, dispersed around the organization, not centrally within the system team. The other thing is, uh, uh, I forget what the first question you asked because I got so fired up, but how to do it? Yeah, how do you, uh, Ryan, when, when people want to propose a variant to the, something uh, that is in the system, how do you have that conversation? Uh, yeah. So lots of people, including Brad Frost, who I think is awesome, have diagrams or, or uh, flow charts that depict different questions and whether it's a snowflake and so on to, to understand, does it go in the system or not? And that's a great thing to talk about. But the leading thing to me is two words, shared need. I always want to start the conversation with, okay, that's great that you have a solution and that it's important for your local product experience. Help me understand how is this going to benefit others? Who else is asking for it? How is this going to create and project value by us investing in the greater level of rigor, almost always, to put it in a more central place and potentially, at most, break how our existing thing works so that your thing works with it? And so if you can't have the shared need conversation or it's completely unclear, I really don't want to keep talking about it. But if there is a shared need, then we need to talk about the level of alignment and, and the gaps that exist between what you made and what's already in the system, determine whether or not we can normalize them. And then let's start talking about the process of if the system team's going to make it or you're going to make it, what's the level of quality that it needs to reach, like the central core highest level of quality or can it be good enough? And what does good enough mean? How are you going to project out your, are you going to publish it from a different library? Or are we going to integrate it into the core library? You know, those kinds of questions around yeah. 
who and what and how good, you know, would be where the conversation goes. Yeah, you know, it, all, it makes me think also of the gray area that emerges, which is there's the shared need, but not necessarily to the earlier point, you know, something that needs to be part of the, the, the core system, at least. And, you know, we, we again, from a, a tooling standpoint, you know, sometimes we, we'd say if we're not, take away the design system label, what our platform is trying to do is help people capture and reuse and iterate on existing design and code solutions. That doesn't say whether it's the official core system or it's other stuff. So what we often see is really simply, imagine your documentation you know, site and there's just different sections of the nav for the, the system, the official thing and the community section, the contribution section, right? Because you know whether someone has a new Figma component because they, they figured that they keep using this message thing with consistent variants that isn't in the system or someone built a React and a web component implementation of some little other component, right? giving teams the ability to contribute and share. And then you also have, can build a governance model based on kind of promoting things after you say, you know what, there's actually a coalescence around this. We don't, it doesn't have to be either or. It's not like it's the system or you're on your own. And that either or mentality often is what we see leads to those, those factions that become the, whatever, the renegade subsystems. And then there's 10 systems because it's, you know, I can't get what I need here. And so I guess, but I see the need and the shared need even. And so yeah. if you can, you know, per the point of intentionality, if you can find a way to match that need in the way you operate, it's an unlock. Yeah, I, I tend to characterize two poles and there needs to be a space in the middle. There's the central thing made by the central team that everybody uses. And there are local libraries made by a different team that only they use. But there is a space in the middle, which is shared libraries made by people not on the core team that everybody can see and choose to use if they want to. And so I think your product is already built with the assumption that you're covering both those spaces, the shared and the core space. Yeah. But the other thing is also like the, there is still a role for the central core team members in that shared ecosystem. And that is a curator's role. You yes. need to make sure that naming is clear. You need to make sure that there's nothing that's redundant or confusing. For example, one team that made a progress bar called a progress bar when there's already a thing called progress bar in the core. And all their progress bar did was enable a progress bar that has a hint of text on the bottom of it. Yeah, you could have added that to the core thing, but they made another thing called it the same thing. And suddenly people are confused which progress bar I'm supposed to right. use. It's the curator's role to make sure that you avoid those kinds of confusions within an ecosystem that you need to keep clean, you need to keep clear. But so long as that's the case, you don't necessarily need to say, don't make a progress bar extension. We can't make it, nobody benefits. Like that, that's not the, the role of the central person. We had a, there was a moment and we hosted a, a design leadership event uh, last year in the summer. And um, there was a moment where a bunch of folks kind of had this moment of, should we all have a librarian on our design system teams? Like someone who just knows the fun. catalog so well and helps the curator, it helps people make the decision of, oh, you're just actually looking for this. Um, hey, good idea. But here's the reason that that's, you know, should be its own thing. So, uh, you know, worthy consideration, the Dewey Decimal System is coming back. <laughs> I don't know about uh, that. <laughs> So one last thing to, to wrap up us wrap us up. I think this goes actually back to kind of you know, something I know a lot of teams struggle with is still the how do I get buy in right to the age old question. There's a question in the chat around you know it, it's from a technical perspective even I I, got, I have a company that I know would benefit from systems but they've also been really successful with this product that frankly could be built better you know our operation could be better like how do you how do you make that case for you know we should be doing this even though margins might be okay. I think the you have to first acknowledge that the like the Damon author I keep referring to, design systems aren't a simple contagion. You don't just sneeze and somebody else sitting next <laughs> to you says, I got your email, there's a system, I'm totally gonna use it. It's a complex contagion and there's lots of different facets that influence a particular person making that decision. So you need to understand what those facets are for them. Often it can be an individual conversation. Sure, you can talk about Consistency, nobody cares, or efficiency, prove it to me. But like those are the basic sort of buzzwords of selling a system. But yeah. instead, how how are you understanding the challenges and pains of how they're facing their roadmaps and facing what their bottom lines are? And how is the system going to help them reach their bottom lines? Sometimes it's because an exec executive says you have to do it, and if they don't, they get fired. Okay, that's easy too. But talk to them, understand what's going to influence them. And and get a sense uh, of pains that they know or don't know and how the system are going to address those pains. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I think that 
Um, I think that brings us just to about the end of our time. So, again, we're going to follow up with uh, everyone who registered. We'll send a link that, uh, to a page where you can download or watch the recording, download, uh, you know, assets, link to the blog post that uh, related to our conversation. So, um, thank you very much for carving out a good chunk of time here and, and being an engaged audience, asking your questions. Uh, we'll try and follow up with those who uh, we didn't get time for the live answers here. Uh, and thank you, Nathan, for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate all your insights. You bet. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.